Hello, PSI 21 Elementary Astronomy. This is Professor Ringwald, today covering chapter 12 of the beginning of some classes on telescopes. In particular, the question, why refracting telescopes reach their maximum practical size with the Yerkes 40 inch refractor in 1897. When you say the word telescope, most people who are not astronomers think of something <coughs> with lenses, something like this, the 40 inch or one meter refracting telescope at Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. It was the largest telescope in the world in 1897. Since then, large telescopes have been different using mirrors. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. But a telescope with lenses, like most people think telescopes are, are called refracting telescopes or refractors. They use lenses. And the principle is very simple. You just have two lenses, like I'm showing here, and you put one in front of the other and you can focus light into an image. If you look at my screen, you probably can see my eye through the two lenses, two lenses, and line them up and focus an image. And the image will, if you hold the lenses in the right place, the image will be bigger than the original. In other words, it'll be magnified. The 40 inch refracting telescope at Eureka's Observatory has a lens 40 inches in diameter. So this particular telescope I've just made with two lenses has maybe, let's see, a three and a half inch, I'm measuring it with a ruler, three and a half inch diameter or aperture, the technical term for which is diameter, but it's the same thing, rather is aperture, but it's the same thing as the diameter, the diameter of the front lens, the objective lens, the big one that gathers the light. And the lens in the back, the eyepiece straightens the rays of light out so you can get a good image. So here we go, a telescope, two lenses, the objective and the eyepiece, and you put the objective in front of the eyepiece and look through it. They only come to a focus in certain places, but nevertheless, and I can get an image that is much bigger than the original, a magnified image. So that's, that's the essential principle behind telescopes, although most telescopes in use by astronomers nowadays use mirrors. I'll tell you about that in a few slides from now. In 1897, with this gigantic telescope in uh, Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, built in 1897, it was the world's largest refracting telescopes. And the refracting telescopes, it was recognized at the time in 1897, had reached their maximum practical size with that telescope. Astronomers realized to make telescopes larger and capable of gathering more light, seeing fainter objects, they would have to turn to a fundamentally new technology. And they have since then with mirrors, reflecting telescopes, using curved mirrors to reflect light. But refractors, which is what most people think of who are not astronomers, uh, they think of when they hear the word telescope, use lenses which refract or bend light. A problem with this is they also bright, uh, split light into its component colors, much as prisms do. This is called chromatic aberration, which is a fancy way of saying color error. Chromatic means color and aberration means error. The point is that the lenses split the light into their component colors, much like a prism does, like Isaac Newton did. Uh, therefore, it complicates color photography. To reduce chromatic aberration, many refractors have long focal lengths. So the tube is very long. Therefore, the lenses don't have to be so extreme. The, 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 the 
curved surfaces, polished surfaces of the lens don't have to be extreme. They, it, this reduces chromatic aberration, but it makes for a telescope tube that's very big and long. So to reduce chromatic aberration, many refractors have a long focal length. This means that refractor tubes are very long, no way to fold them up as with reflectors. Reflectors use mirrors to focus light. You can therefore uh, fold them up. And there are many ways of making uh, reflector telescopes to do various things. Refractors basically are all just about the same. A big old objective lens in the front and an eyepiece in the back and a long tube in between them. This means that refractors often have long tubes, tall piers, and to house them domes like great cathedral and consequently, consequentially huge costs. And the Yerkes refractor was no exception. This enormous dome uh, is um, it's huge. It's like a, the dome of a great cathedral. Um, a telescope with a mirror the same size as this big lens, 40 inches in diameter, or one meter in diameter, basically would, would be much smaller, not requiring this towering tall peel to, pier to sit on, and requiring a much smaller dome and much less expensive dome. So it was recognized when this telescope, the 40-inch refracting telescope at Yerkes Observatory, was completed in 1897. Uh, this was the end of this technology, of what this technology of using uh, lenses and refracting telescopes could do. From then on, the largest telescope in the world has always been a reflector. And also, this was the last time the world's largest telescope at the time in 1897 was sighted at an essentially sea level site, Yerkes Bay, Wisconsin. Um, there aren't many hills. There are a few low hills, but not very, very high. The elevation above sea level of, your, of uh, this observatory is roughly 600 feet, which is nothing compared to the uh, elevations of the great mountaintop observatories in the American West, like Lick Observatory, which was getting started uh, at roughly the same time, it was the first permanent mountaintop observatory, thus demonstrating, despite the increased cost, the value of putting telescopes on top of mountains above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere, which does a lot to spoil the images. So refractors, because of the color error, because of the need to reduce the, the chromatic aberration of the color error, but they have long tubes, tall piers, domes like great cathedral, and are very costly. An equivalent one meter telescope, able to see just as deep into space that uses a uh, mirror would cost nowadays about uh, $1 million. The Yerkes refractor in its day cost the current equivalent of $25 million. So it is possible still to make lenses with telescopes. And again, many optical systems have lenses. It's hard to imagine how you could make a pair, a pair of eyeglasses with mirrors. What would you probably have something big and, boxy, uh, big and boxy to stick on somebody's face. Well, that's no good. So we use lenses. And for small telescopes like binoculars, we still use lenses. But for large telescopes like, like we like in astronomy, because we like to look really faint and a large aperture will gather more light and enable astronomers to see uh, much fainter, uh, mostly use uh, reflectors. This refracting design appropriate for small telescopes doesn't really work for large telescopes and hasn't since 1897. Um, refractors also have bad dome effects seeing from their huge domes trapping lots of air. This huge dome traps lots of air that gets warmed uh, by sunlight on the exterior of the dome in the daytime. And when they open the dome shutters, this warm air goes right out, right through the dome slit where the telescope is pointing through to point at the sky. And the air gets very turbulent and this blurs the images, which is no good. Modern telescopes have extensive, modern telescopes have extensive ventilation system big fans installed in the walls of the telescope 
to even out the temperature between the inside and the outside. Well, none of that was known in 1897. And one of the advantages of the Lick Observatory outside of San Jose, California, is that the images were always superb because it's on a tall mountain above much of the turbulent Earth's atmosphere. Whereas Yerkes was essentially at a sea level site. So looking through the murk of the Earth's atmosphere. Also, Mount Hamilton outside of San Jose, where the site of Lick Observatory gets about 300 clear nights a year. Yerkes Observatory in Wisconsin gets about 100 nights a year. And from November to June, there is a howling blizzard in Wisconsin. Uh, starts every year on the 1st of November and lasts well into May. Really isn't until the 1st of June that the weather. So a whole, more than half of the year, not usable at all for astronomy. So um, astronomers have fond memories, sentimental attachment to this telescope, but very little science gets done with it. There are so much better telescopes nowadays. Again, it's over 100 years old. Uh, other, other problems with refractors are that lenses bend out of shape over time due to their own weight. This lens in the front is 40 inches in diameter. It's what's called a 40-inch telescope. And it's called a refracting telescope because it uses a, a big lens, not a mirror. It's 40 inches in diameter, therefore it gathers lots of light, can see very faint objects. But it weighs over a ton. And the glass, since 1897, has been bending gradually out of shape due to its own weight. So the precise optical performance of this system, of this telescope, are currently not known because they were very different from when uh, it, it, it started. Again, not a lot of science is done with this telescope anymore. Another, uh, uh, mirrors do not do this. A reflecting telescope which uses a mirror to focus light, you can support from the back and therefore steel support. Nowadays, they're computer controlled and really precise and they focus light very well because uh, um, you only have the front surface to worry about. Glass from which lenses are made must be absolutely perfect with no bubbles or cracks and perfectly transparent. Mirrors are a lot more forgiving. Only the front surface matters. Mirrors only need to be polished and uh, aluminized. In the old days, they used to make mirrors um, reflective by coating them with silver. So the mirrors were silvered. Problem other than cost with silver is that it tarnishes, aluminum doesn't. So mo more modern reflecting telescopes use uh, mirrors, just about every mirror you've ever seen in your life, except for antique ones are aluminized, done by depositing uh, vapor of aluminum on the front surface. The point is that a mirror is more forgiving. The optics of a mirror is more forgiving. Only the front surface matters. Only the front surface matters. Whereas the lenses, both the front and the back surfaces matter, and the glass in between them matters. So mirrors only need to be polished and aluminized, uh, formerly silvered, on one side. Lenses need at least two sides, and so typically are at least twice as expensive. And they're typically a lot more expensive than telescopes with mirrors, than reflecting telescope. An eight inch reflector, reflector similar to the ones we have in the range, uh, which we use when we have in-person classes, uh, have a diameter about you know, diameter of eight inches. Uh, they typically cost about $500, great for student equipment. An equivalent eight inch refractor with a lens the same diameter, eight inches in diameter, typically costs about $10,000. And again, the 40-inch refracting telescope at Yerkes Observatory has a lens 40 inches in diameter. It's the world's largest refracting telescope or refractor because it uses a lens, uses lenses. And uh, they're, the big one, the objective that gathers the light is 40 inches in diameter. So that's why they call it a 40-inch telescope. Refraction, of course, is the property of light that makes a uh, light bend uh, when light passes from one material, say air, to another material, say water, it's because the speed of light in water is less than the speed of light in air. 
the speed of light in the air is less than the speed of light in an empty space. And the speed of light in glass is less than the speed of light in water. So when light goes from one material, one medium, where the speed of light is high, rather higher to another where the speed of light is lower, it bends the light. And this is how lenses bend and focus light. A problem with lenses is, of course, the color error, also known as chromatic aberration. Chromatic means color, aberration means error. Basically, it's the same situation as a prism. Glass is transparent to light, but it bends blue light more than it bends red light. In other words, it refracts blue light more than it reflects uh, red light. Most transparent materials are like this. Uh, this property is called dispersion. The problem is that the focus for blue light, short wavelength light, is different from the focus for red light, long wavelength light. So this complicates color photography. And here is an example of it. This is a picture of a lunar eclipse where the Earth casts a shadow on the moon. And you can see the Earth is round because it casts a round shadow on the moon, just like Aristotle noticed. What I want to point out of this image is this little violet halo around the edge of the image. That's not there. The moon is a big rock. Even if the Earth is casting a shadow on it, the moon doesn't have a little violet halo. This is something that the telescope is doing. It is showing us something that isn't there, uh, which is called an image artifact. We don't like that. We like telescopes to show us what's really there, the way it really looks. And this is not the way it really looks. That is a little uh, violet halo caused by the color error, chromatic aberration in the telescope. I had this telescope focused to uh, focus red light best. And notice that the blue light, or actually the violet light, which even has shorter wavelengths, is very much out of focus. So it gives the image a little violet halo that is not there. We hate that. So astronomers typically use different technology for telescopes, namely reflecting telescopes, uses mirrors. They use curved mirrors to concentrate light. So reflecting telescope uses mirrors, not lenses. Isaac Newton, during his miracle year, the same year in which he uh, discovered the laws of motion and gravity, invented calculus, invented a type of telescope, the reflecting telescope, and of course did experiments with optics. And I love this image because very symbolic Newton letting in the light. Isaac Newton invented the Newtonian reflector, a type of reflecting telescope. Notice there's a, in, this is looking straight down the tube of reflecting telescope. Uh, some of the ones we use in lab, unfortunately, we will not be able to use them um, unless we have in-person classes. But it's similar to this. Notice it's a curved mirror. It's not a flat mirror like your bathroom mirror. It's a curved mirror, and it can concentrate light. And the light comes up, and there is another flat mirror held here by a support called a spider, although they typically have three legs as opposed to eight legs for a spider, and reflects the light out an eyepiece on the side. And this has the advantage that you don't have to crane your neck looking through it. A well-designed reflecting telescope, a well-designed Newtonian reflector using the design um, uh, invented by Isaac Newton has the eyepiece uh, right at eye level. So it's very convenient. A refractor, which is typically much bigger, again, focusing light with lenses, uh, is shown here to uh, have its eyepiece, its, its image that it's focusing at eye level. But if you point this straight up, notice that the eyepiece will be over here. She will have to crouch, crouch down to see it. And likewise, if you're looking at something along the horizon, she's going to have to stand out of a tall ladder. I hate climbing a ladder in the dark to get to a telescope in the eyepiece. You don't often don't have a strong sense of which end is up, and you do not want to fall off the ladder. Um, so Isaac Newton invented the, this particular design of the reflecting telescope. A common error that you see in textbooks is that he invented the reflecting telescope. He didn't. James Bradley beat him to it by six years, invented the uh, reflecting telescope, the Gregorian. Uh, Gregorian optics uh, uh, reflecting telescope in 1660. 
uh, which uh, shine, which um, reflects light out a hole in the back. Uh, problem is you need to drill a hole in the uh, mirror to do that. That's not so easy. Newton had a much simpler design uh, out the side. With the added advantage, you don't have to crouch down behind the telescope to look, to look at it. You can basically look through it either from high in the sky or low in the sky, essentially at eye level for an eight inch reflector, one with a mirror eight inches in diameter. And again, this is a much smaller and simpler telescope and the mirror is easier to polish because only the front surface matters. An eight inch reflecting telescope, similar to the ones we use in labs uh, at the range and in-person classes, uh, typically costs about $500. An eight inch refractor typically is $10,000 because a much bigger telescope, much longer tube, much taller pier, much more difficult to house in a, in a, in a observatory dome. You need a much bigger dome. And um, you have to polish both the front and back of the lenses. And typically telescopes these days use two lenses. So that's one, two, three, four uh, surfaces to have to polish. So, and polishing the surfaces is the labor intensive and therefore the expensive part. So refracting telescopes of the same size, eight, eight inches in diameter, um, they're typically at least four times, and usually a lot more uh, expensive than reflecting telescopes. So we go with reflecting telescopes. Reflecting telescopes can also be built in many ways. A refractor is of course, just this one design but a reflector can be built in many ways. Isaac Newton's uh, uh, design, again, there's a parabolic primary mirror that focuses the light. The light comes in from the sky and gets focused by the parabolic primary mirror. There's a flat secondary mirror and it shines the light out the eyepiece and that's where you uh, look or you can mount a camera. Another way to do it is by prime focus. Namely, mount a camera right at the focus where the uh, light would have come to a focus if the secondary mirror hadn't been there under a Newtonian reflector. And people always ask, doesn't the camera block some of the light? And it does. But for a big telescope, it's really not that much and doesn't really do much to the image. Because notice, this is an astronomical telescope. It's focused on essentially infinity. It's looking at something very far away. Therefore, something right in front of it, right at the focus, is totally, totally, totally out of focus because the telescope is focused at very, 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 very distant sources. Again, essentially focused on infinity, at stars deep in the universe. So prime vertical focus works uh, very well, especially for a larger telescope, and you get a really wide field of view. Uh, with it, with a camera and a digital camera, of course, can all be operated by remote control. So you don't even have to have a camera. You don't even have to have wire sticking out of here. You can, folk, you can basically mount it on the spider and it's fine. Another way to make a reflecting telescope is called a cast grain telescope. It's where you have a secondary mirror at the prime focus, just ahead of where the prime focus would be. But this is not a flat secondary mirror. It's another curved mirror, similar to the parabolic primary mirror. And you focus the light out through a hole drilled in the primary mirror. And drilling this hole is a nerve wracking business. You cannot undo a mistake by hitting control Z. Uh, but nevertheless, it does give you a telescope that works pretty much like a refractor does. Namely, you look in through an eyepiece at the back or mount a camera at the back. There are, of course, ways to combine both refractor and reflector telescopes. Refractor uh, technology with um, lenses and reflecting technology, reflector technology with uh, mirrors. And this is called a schmidt cassegrain telescope where you, you, again, gather the light with a... Um, with a uh, concave primary mirror, instead of a parabolic one, which is difficult to polish and expensive, just a spherical mirror will do a lot cheaper. And you compensate for the bad things this does to the image with a corrector plate, which is basically a lens over the front. And you can make a really nice image. And notice in a really short tube, so the telescope doesn't have to be big or long, it's therefore much easier to transport, much easier to carry. 
Therefore, they're popular with amateur astronomers who typically will take a telescope, put it in their car, drive up to the mountains over the weekend, uh, look and observe under a really nice dark sky. They're also smaller than, uh, shorter than even reflector telescopes and much, much shorter than the tubes for refractor telescopes. So it's easier to uh, mount one in an observatory if you can build an observatory in your backyard. We have one in that aluminum structure on the lawn just west of the Downing Planetarium. I use it for upper level students. I've never figured out an effective way to use it for this class, PSI 21, because the class is simply too large. And that campus observatory basically seats four people uncomfortably. Hard to imagine how we're gonna get a class of 100 in there. So reflecting telescopes can be built in many ways because you're reflecting light, therefore you can fold up the uh, tube in a variety of ways. So here is a typical observatory class telescope, the kind that astronomers, professional astronomers use to do research. It has a primary mirror, one meter in diameter. Some easy to remember statistics. One meter diameter, one meter aperture, one ton, it weighs a ton, that mirror, and it typically costs $1 million. Amateur astronomers and uh, labs, of course, for uh, university classes typically use smaller telescopes, one, being, one, one reason being they're easier to transport. This weighs a ton, therefore it's permanently mounted in an observatory dome. This is at Cerro Inter-American Observatory in Chile and uh, mounted at the focus is a very, very, very sensitive uh, digital camera. And uh, you can image objects quite faint with it. This is a flat field used to calibrating the image. You point the telescope at the flat field and uh, illuminate it uniformly. It, 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 it calibrates your electronic sensor very accurately. And of course, typically covered by modern electronics with the various electronic cameras used. But of course, this is a telescope for visible light. One of the biggest things in the past couple of generations of astronomy, the past 60 or 70 years, a generation being 30 years, is that we don't just observe with visible light like your eyes can see. Astronomers nowadays can observe with X-rays, with gamma rays, with infrared radiation, with microwaves, and with radio waves. The opening of the electromagnetic spectrum helps astronomers learn a lot faster and a lot better about the universe than when we could only use visible light like your eyes can see. Thing is, there are various technologies uh, needed to uh, detect this electromagnetic radiation. For example, the largest telescopes are radio telescopes. They're big radio dishes. The concept is similar to uh, satellite dishes that you might have uh, on your house. This particular one is on the top of a gas station to make the ATM work. Uh, but astronomers have been making these dishes uh, ever since the 1930s. This one was built in 1957. It is 250 feet across, so therefore it's called the 250-foot Mark I radio telescope at Jodrell Bank in jolly old England. English weather comes as advertised. Every day of the year, it's cloudy and drizzly. That bright yellow sunlight that you often see in Fresno and see just about every day in the summer in Fresno, you never see in England. In England. The light is always gray and muted. Shows up great on video in old BBC TV shows. Um, so radio, this is a radio telescope. It, it senses uh, sensitive radio waves from deep in space. And I point out, notice the clouds because this radio telescope is in England. England uh, is, because the weather in England is so terrible all the time, uh, it is not, there are not many state-of-the-art astronomical observatories uh, in England. This, however, is a state-of-the-art astronomical observatory because it's a radio telescope. It operates on radio wavelengths. Uh, clouds are transparent to radio waves, unlike visible light. 
Radio astronomers have other things that bother them, though, such as cell phones. You, you're usually not allowed to use a cell phone uh, within a certain distance of a radio telescope because the electrical interference isn't good for them. Car ignitions are also a problem. Electric motors are also a problem. Uh, lightning is also a problem, but you get very little lightning in jolly old England. It's just about always drizzly every day. The thing is, radio waves are very long. Visible light has a wavelength that's microscopic in size, half a micron in size, not much bigger than a bacterium, not too much bigger than a human cell. Uh, actually, not much smaller than a human cell. Um, the thing is, um, this is why, because visible light has a wavelength that's so short, this is why it took until so late in history, until 1865, for people to figure out that light is a wave. That James Kirk Maxwell showed that light is a wave. Um, and um, the radio waves have much longer wavelengths, centimeters or meters are longer. So therefore, you could make radio telescopes much bigger than optical telescopes much more easily because the surface does not have to be as smooth. It doesn't have to be polished like a lens or a mirror for visible light. Uh, you can basically just bolt it together out of sheet metal. And if there's a rivet that tall on the sheet level, it doesn't really matter because the wavelength of the radio waves are several centimeters, much bigger than that. Uh, so therefore you can make the reflecting surfaces to gather the radio waves much bigger. And it makes for a very, very, very sensitive telescopes. So therefore radio telescopes have the largest apertures of any telescopes and they are the most sensitive. Microwave telescopes also have large aperture. This particular one in Arizona has an, has an aperture, has a dish that's 12 meters in diameter. So it's the 12 meter microwave telescope at Arizona Radio Observatory. Um, Microwaves have shorter wavelengths than radio waves, typically uh, about one millimeter as opposed to centimeters or meters for radio telescopes. So therefore, uh, microwaves, microwave telescopes tend to be smaller. This particular one, the radio telescope is 250 meters in diameter. This one is 12 meters in diameter, so it's smaller because it's necessary to make a more precise surface, a more carefully uh, polished surface to focus the microwaves proper since they have shorter wavelengths. This one, these are on Mauna Kea, Hawaii, one of the best observing sites in the world. And they are mostly for visible light. In other words, optical, like your eyes can see. And in the front are for infrared radiation. This is called submillimeter uh, alley for uh, Submillimeter uh, and um, infrared are have shorter wavelengths than microwaves, but longer wavelengths than visible light. And again, these the ones for visible light in the background are uh, are, uh, are are telescopes that focus visible light, like your eyes can see. Earth's atmosphere is transparent only to visible light and to radio waves. So, and I've made this graphic here the various wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation, gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet. Visible light is, of course, the only electromagnetic radiation the NA and I can see. And it comes all the way down to sea level because the Earth's atmosphere is transparent to visible light. You can see through the Earth's atmosphere with your eyes. That's probably no coincidence why our eyes are sensitive to the wavelengths that they are sensitive. And uh, But ultraviolet x-rays and gamma rays are not. Their high, this high energy radiation is blocked by ozone. So here's a graphic showing that for gamma rays, you have to be above maybe about 20 or 30 kilometers above the surface of the earth to be able to observe gamma rays. And sometimes astronomers do this with balloons. And for X-rays, you have to be over hundred kilometers above the surface of the earth. You can send up a rocket with an X-ray detector and get maybe one image and ultraviolet, uh, it's even harder. Um, Earth's atmosphere is not transparent to ultraviolet radiation. It's good because uh, it would burn our skin otherwise. Uh, in, in, in particular, the gas that does this is ozone, stratospheric ozone. 
in the Earth's uh, atmosphere, the Earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, but if you've got a big budget, it is possible to observe gamma rays or X-rays or ultraviolet with an Earth orbiting satellite. And these are great. This is Hubble Space Telescope, which can observe ultraviolet and visible light and quite a bit of infrared. This is Chandra X-ray Observatory, which can observe X-rays. And this is Fermi Space Telescope, which can observe uh, gamma rays. And they're all orbiting satellites completely above the Earth's atmosphere, orbiting the Earth at an altitude of over 400 uh, kilometers above the surface of Earth. And therefore, um, actually more like 300 kilometers above the surface of Earth. And therefore, they have no problem observing gamma rays or X-rays or ultraviolet. Problem is they're rather expensive. So astronomers tend to still use balloons or rockets whenever they don't have such a big budget. Infrared radiation is absorbed by carbon dioxide and water vapor. Some of it does get through. The short wavelength infrared can be observed from a telescope on the surface of the Earth, a ground-based telescope, particularly if you put it on a really tall mountain like Mauna Kea. Problem is Mauna Kea is so tall, everybody gets altitude sick. I am proud to say I didn't get any of the nausea, but I did have a terrible headache the whole time. And it felt like there was an elephant standing on my chest the whole time. Uh, after, the, after two days, I was ready to go. You think Hawaii would be a fun place to go so you can recuperate down on the beach, but on the mountain, it's mm, uh, rather uh, strenuous. Thing is, infrared uh, radiation is absorbed by carbon dioxide, water vapor, uh, high energy radiation like gamma rays, X rays, and ultraviolet are, are absorbed, blocked by ozone. Infrared radiation is absorbed by carbon dioxide and water vapor, and therefore, to observe infrared radiation, NASA currently has a large telescope mounted in uh, a old 747 jetliner with a door cut in the fuselage and a, and, and, uh, a door that swings back and enables the telescope to observe. It's gyro-stabilized, of course, and the pilot is always careful to fly level and straight. Um, and it works quite well. There have also been infrared uh, spacecraft. This one was the, the uh, Spitzer Space Telescope. And there have been others, again, orbiting the Earth's, uh, above the Earth's surface, completely above the atmosphere, so uh, capable of uh, really wonderful infrared observations. Problem, it's costly. Satellites are expensive. So therefore, NASA may be saving uh, the astronomers uh, quite a bit of money with this uh, airborne telescope. And again, Earth's atmosphere is transparent only to visible light and radio waves. So visible light gets to the surface of Earth. Therefore, you can have visible light telescopes with light like your eyes can see, visible light on the surface of Earth at sea level. And likewise with radio telescopes. Here's a radio telescope and it's shown at sea level uh, where Earth's atmosphere is transparent to radio waves. Hubble Space Telescope is a space telescope. It's above the Earth's atmosphere. It detects wavelengths of light not observable from the ground, including ultraviolet and infrared radiation. Also, since it's above the um, Earth's atmosphere, even in visible light, which can be observed from the ground, it gets much clearer images because you're not looking through the turbulence of Earth's atmosphere. And you can't observe ultraviolet or infrared at all from uh, the surface of Earth. Well, ultraviolet, certainly. You can't observe uh, from the surface of Earth, except for near ultraviolet wavelengths. But most of the ultraviolet spectrum you can't observe at all from the Earth's atmosphere because it's absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, by ozone, stratospheric ozone in the Earth's atmosphere, which is good because it would burn our skin otherwise and it'd be harmful to vegetation. Um, it's Hubble Space Telescope is not a space probe. It doesn't fly from planet to planet. It's just a big telescope comparable to one that you might find in a big observatory, uh, delivered by space shuttle at great cost by NASA some time ago. Hubble was launched by, delivered in Earth orbit, launched by a space shuttle in 1990, and it's still the best telescope that astronomers have available to them. Although later this year, there is scheduled to be launched a bigger telescope into space called the James Webb Space Telescope. We'll see how that goes. 
If Hubble is above the Earth's atmosphere, it detects wavelengths of light not observable from the ground, including ultraviolet infrared radiation. And even the visible light, it also detects. The images are sharper and better. So, and anyway, that is the end of class of this class. So let's stop there for today.